This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Baglin. A special occasion today as we spend the hour with the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife Commissioner. Gregory Johnson is a lifetime hunter, angler, and outdoorsman. He came aboard in 2014 and continues to sail the ship steady as she goes. What's on his plate that affects you and me and the sportsmen, sportswomen, and sports kids of the state and robust wildlife? We go inside outdoors to find out next on Kentucky Afield Radio. Deer in the headlights. Watch out, Mr. Deer. (laughs) Singing with your kids in the car is one way to keep deer hazard season in mind. And should a deer catch your headlights, flash those lights, sound your horn, break its concentration to scurry it along. There's one. And where there's one, there may be two or three more. Deer hazard season runs through November. So be wise behind the wheel while nature runs its course. A message from Fish and Wildlife and the Kentucky Office of Highway Safety. Tomorrow morning, I have a 6.45 meeting. It's with the sunrise. And those important clients, I brought them with me. Look, Mom, a deer! I have a feeling this day will outperform all others. Did you see that fish? Let's go down to the lake. (laughs) It's great to be outnumbered. It's great to be outdoors. The Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. In so many ways, our work in the outdoors brings out the best in you. Welcome to Kentucky Field Radio. This is Charlie Baglin. If it's at the tire store or on our kids' soccer team or in business, our pulse is a little calmer when someone is at the helm who we trust. Today on the show, we have the commissioner of the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. He's ours for the hour. And we'll chat about our state, its wildlife, and projects in the offing to make this a better and richer place for people and rabbits and quail and grouse and ducks and deer for us all to call home. Greg Johnson, welcome. Hi, Charlie. How you doing? Now, there's not a whole lot that the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife can do on its own. Partnerships pretty much make the world go around, and we talk about those, like, say, with the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife Foundation, the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Wild Turkey Federation. Our list is long, but one that people may not really consider that our partners are, are other state fish and wildlife agencies. Back in October, you had a conference in Louisville with the fish and wildlife agencies across the southeast. Kentucky had the distinct opportunity of being able to host it in Louisville at the Galt House. Probably over about 600 people attended. Of course, all my counterparts across the southeast, uh, most of them are called directors in their positions rather than a commissioner. But we meet as a board, and uh, we, we consider a lot of grant opportunities. We talk about and try to collaborate on studies across the southeast on at-risk species, habitat evaluations, grant opportunities. We look at federal regulations and federal rules as they might affect the operations of the southeast states. So it's just a good time to really coordinate on all that and have one voice. It sounds like a lot of neckties versus hiking boots. Do you get out in the field? Do you show them parts of Kentucky or at least nearby to Louisville? Yeah, we do that. We make sure they uh, squish the mud between their toes, so to speak. (laughs) So we brought them out to our Mollusk Research Center and see some of the latest technology that we're using there to uh, rear and raise and repropagate mollusks and how we're working with other states to do that. They got to tour Churchill Downs and engage in some racing activities there along with the museum. So they get a flavor for the state that they're in. Other events that I've been at in other states, we'd go out and do a dove hunt or we'd go out and do some trout fishing. We were in Florida and we went out and did some deep sea fishing. So the directors always try to get out and engage in some kind of field activity during the conference. You talk about the southeast, and I'm wondering if because of where Kentucky is, a mid-latitude state, the northernmost in the southeast, Does that put Kentucky at a disadvantage? And what I mean by that is, do we have to know what's going on north of us and south of us? 
we're also a part of the Midwest Conference, too, right? That's correct. Does that give us double duty? Oh, yeah, it, it gives you double duty, but uh, I think it'd be foolish for Kentucky and its geographic proximity to not be associated with both the Midwest and the Southeast Association. What is the uh-huh. thread, you think, that ties us to the Southeast? And I don't mean like deer, bear. What are some of the species that we're all concerned with? Well, in the Southeast, it would be bear controlling wild pigs. Other invasive species, such as Asian carp, which is also a big concern in the Midwest as well. Uh, deer diseases, such as CWD. Um, at-risk species, which... Florida, of course, has more than anybody. If you ever look at a map of threatened and endangered species, and if it was color-coded with red having the most, Florida is going to be beat red compared to any other state in the mm-hmm. nation. Also, we have uh, law enforcement things that overlap. Folks that engage in illegal turtle trades, bear gallbladders. Uh, so what techniques are law enforcement using in other states that would work here to apprehend those folks that want to violate our fish and game laws. What are we learning? What's Kentucky learning from our association with these other southeastern states? What one thing maybe jumps out at you? The main thing is we're all faced with the similar pressures. Pressures up the food chain with a cabinet that you might be part of working with the governor's office. You have lateral pressures working with the, uh, the legislatures in each state. You have customer pressures because we all have a multitude of customers and customer interests. And then working down uh, with employees and employee issues, employee motivation, diversification of employee workforce, leadership training, which we coordinate on that across the southeast. So you have uh, all these issues that crosswalk across all the states so we can share and learn from each other. People certainly recognize state borders. But animals don't. Fish don't. Birds don't. Migrating geese. They don't know where Kentucky starts and Tennessee stops. But there are international, there are larger scale associations Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife needs to be part of. Mississippi Flyway Council comes to mind. We're part of the Mississippi Flyway Council. So uh, we're we're engaged with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in uh, monitoring that population and then setting the the harvest rates for uh, waterfowl. Uh, Another one people may not think about is uh, spoonbill catfish. Uh, They are a target species for the caviar industry. Their harvest is uh, closely monitored in a lot of states, all the way out to Kansas and Nebraska, to Kentucky, uh, but trying to make sure we're monitoring that spoonbill catfish population, and that has to be done cooperatively with all those other states. I remember some talk years ago that Kentucky had a big hand in the caviar business. You really wouldn't think of it. Well, the caviar industry in Kentucky is is much bigger than people think, and most of it revolves around spoonbill catfish. It's just making sure that we set harvest rates on spoonbill catfish that are sustainable given their use for uh, caviar production. We monitor that and set that and cooperate with other states to do that. Kentucky went through a rough patch. During westward expansion, unregulated hunting was in the mix. We lost a lot of indigenous species. In the past 30 years or so, we have endeavored to restore a few of them. I recall that the elk that Kentucky has actually came from other states, uh, Utah, Arizona, Kansas, wild turkey that are in Kentucky. Didn't a lot of those come from Missouri and Louisiana? gave us the river otters Mm -hmm. that we restored to Kentucky. And as far as peregrine falcons, I'm wanting to say North Dakota leaps to mind. So other states help Kentucky, and we have to help them too. Mm -hmm. It helped uh, all the efforts that you just mentioned, Charlie. And then anymore, there's not maybe as much swapping of wildlife now that wildlife and fishery populations have pretty much been reestablished. But now it's more along the lines of perhaps like with our elk program where we're trading some elk to Wisconsin 
and that's more of a cash on the barrel trade. So what's coming back to Kentucky is is cash. The Ho Chunk Indian tribe in Wisconsin is very involved in those elk coming up there, as is the Wisconsin DNR and some other partners. They're real excited about adding to their elk herd. But then we're going to use the the cash from that trade to um, begin our our work on our Young Forest Grouse Initiative in East Kentucky. So the thought process of trying to reestablish grouse in East Kentucky to a huntable population, especially when we have a lot of grouse hunters that are going to Wisconsin, Minnesota, and spending weeks at a time to hunt grouse up there, and they're spending money doing it, having a good time. But why can't we have that back in East Kentucky? Greg Johnson is our guest, and he is the commissioner for the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. Your partner in the great outdoors, more in a minute. You're listening to Kentucky Field Radio. We're back on Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. We are kicked back with the Fish and Wildlife Commissioner, Mr. Greg Johnson. There's no question that Kentucky suffered some growing pains in the early years of our statehood. We lost a great many species of wildlife. Once, the simple thinking was, if you're missing quail, for example, you just put them back. If there's a shortage of raccoons, you raise them in captivity, and you set them free in the woods. A piece of historical trivia for you. This very broadcast, as well as Kentucky Field TV, originates from a building historically known as Quail House 2. Forty or maybe closer to 50 years ago, quail were being raised right here in hopes that if we release them, it would rectify the shortage. But a key component was also missing. Proper habitat. But that was a common practice. That's right. You remember those days? Mm -hmm. The Young Forest Initiative for our ruffed grouse. You can't just grow rough grouse and put them in the woods and expect them to thrive. Well, these things start out more as a a vision and a discussion. Uh, They tend to bubble up from our, our sportsmen and... People in Kentucky will always hear me talk about uh, being sportsman-centric, which means I listen to sportsmen. I take their uh, ideas and concerns seriously. So the problem arose probably a couple decades ago when Daniel Boone National Forest really got conservative on their timber harvesting program. There was different reasons for that. And the private timber industry was after the more uh, mature timber for barrel staves, for the bourbon industry, or for furniture or hardwood flooring. So grouse need this this young forest, and there's not a lot of market for that kind of uh, tree product out there. So what happens is these forests grow up into unusable habitat for species such as grouse, and it'll even affect turkey and elk also in those areas. It seems like people think that The best forest is a very large, mature, old forest with the towering trees. That that's the best and that's what you want. You don't want any of this young stuff. Mm -hmm. You need a mix of all of this. Yeah, and and for some species, you need that uh, very old climax forest. But, you know, if you think back in history to when when Daniel Boone first came to Kentucky and, and Native Americans were here, between natural disasters and Native Americans burning and living off the land, timbers have always been working lands. Uh, and then you have natural disasters. Uh, you take the devastating tornadoes that hit the West Liberty area about three years ago. And we, we have mapped that tornado trail, so to speak, know exactly where it is. To no surprise to us, the grouse have exploded in that tornado trail. Because that's where the trees were blown down. That disturbance. And yeah. new growth started to emerge. That's right. And, of course, when that new growth comes up, the young chicks, they need a steady diet of protein, so they need a lot of insects. And then when they get older, they move to more uh, vegetation for food, but they like that young growth for that as well. And then it provides a, a good mix of cover. So, you know, for grouse, you need mature stands, you need young forest, you need some open areas. Uh, but we just didn't have that mix out there. So now, on purpose, we have identified focus areas in East Kentucky. 
where we're aggressively managing for that mixed stand of timber and that young forest. And we're having success on our clay wildlife management area, a lot of success there. And then uh, I think at our Paintsville wildlife management area, we're pretty aggressive there as well. And we're seeing the grouse respond to those efforts. So in order to get new forest, you need one, depend on tornadoes or windstorms. Or do a timber harvest. Or do a timber harvest, mm-hmm. cut some of it down, yeah, and then let it regrow. Mm-hmm. But you need open areas too. So generally where we find elk in these open strip mine areas, there will also be areas around them with quite a bit of forest in various successional stages. Anybody listening to the show, Commissioner, will say, he's not supposed to know all this stuff. <laughs> He's supposed to know how to administer an apartment and hire and fire and that sort of thing. But you're a biologist early on, aren't you? Yeah. I went to Eastern Kentucky University and uh, ended up with a degree in wildlife management and a minor in fisheries and chemistry. And then uh, when I left there, I worked with the old Soil Conservation Service for USDA. And that was basically helping farmers on working lands put in conservation practices. Then I went on to be the state biologist for the Old Soil Conservation Service for the whole state of Kentucky. And a lot of people won't remember Lauren Schaaf that worked for the department back in the late 80s, but it was Lauren and I that hatched this idea of having Kentucky Fish and Wildlife biologists work cooperatively in USDA offices to work with farmers on on habitat improvement. Went on to be the the biologist for the 8th state Midwest region in Madison, Wisconsin, and then uh, went on to Washington, D.C., and managed uh, billion-dollar programs nationwide uh, on working lands. So and you got a lot of tools in the belt. Yeah, yeah, a lot, a lot of, of experience. Um, you know, grassroots experience and then a lot of high-level type experience. So, yeah. so back to the young forests, and with the deer that there are in this state, now granted there are not, they're not as dense, in eastern Kentucky. But do deer pose a problem to grouse? Because deer will come in and eat, won't they? These young saplings, these young trees? No, not not at the level that the deer are at and the uh, the amount of uh, you know stem density that you have. There's really no wildlife that are going to compete with a young forest situation uh, with grouse. Uh, the biggest problem you have is with predators that, you know, may want to prey on nests or nest success, eggs or chicks, you know, that kind of stuff. We started the program talking about partnerships. What are the partnerships that need to be so that this grouse and young forest initiative can flourish? The main one is the Kentucky forest products industry. We've worked closely with them on this grouse initiative. But, of course, they're the industry that most of the private timber operators belong to. Second to that, of course, would be Daniel Boone National Forest. What can we work with Daniel Boone Forest on where we can cooperatively uh, manage for young forest situations? And not surprisingly, it's going to be where we have wildlife management areas that lie adjacent to the forest, and we can synergistically manage across those, those boundaries. So those are going to be the two main partners in the Grouse Initiative. Uh, the Corps Engineers, because a lot of our properties, the underlying owner is the Corps Engineers. And you can go online on our website and pull up our, our Young Forest Grouse Initiative. I think it's a 10- or 20-year plan, and those focus areas are, are identified in there. 20-year plan. Zach Danks was on the show a couple of years ago talking about this in its earliest days. I mean, the program had just been written up and probably wasn't, ink wasn't even dry on the page. Well, we were still doing public meetings back then, too. Yeah. And you talk about a 10 or 20 year plan. Well, that's great here in the first few years because you're gung ho and you're ready to go and you're revved up. What about 12 years in? Does it lose any of its steam? Well, you know, the way you build. Winning sustainable programs, and by the way, I've, I've coached a lot of sports, so sometimes you'll hear me speak in those terms. You have to, first of all, get good people in place, well-trained people that have a passion for the job and understand the vision and have ownership in it. But then you also have to have what I would call outside groups that also have ownership because that's where the real long-term sustainability comes. 
So since this whole grouse thing started, I think there's been at least three grouse clubs start up in Kentucky, and they're very active. And uh, one has even started some mentorship programs with Eastern Kentucky University and Moorhead State, where they'll take out uh, young hunters that are students at those schools and take them on a grouse hunt. So they're becoming very active, and uh, so that that's how you build long-term, sustainable, successful programs. When you say 20-year program, is this really more like a forever program? It has to continue indefinitely, does it not? Or will it have enough foothold after 20 years that it can survive on its own? Well, I think, Charlie, about any wildlife program never ends. I mean, if you look at our deer herd, numbers almost a million right now, and since the 60s uh, has grown and become very successful, is stabilizing now. But even now, uh, what, 50, 60 years later, you have a whole different realm of management challenges with, a, with the deer herd. So, um, you know, you have disease issues, you have human contact issues, you have crop depredation on farms, um, you have quality deer management. All of these things were never heard of 30 years ago. So when you're managing wildlife, nothing, everything is always a continuum. And it's just different challenges that emerge on the scene as you, as you move down the road. Modern gun deer hunting season is upon us, and up next we'll talk with the commissioner about deer hunting and what hunters should keep in mind if hunting in eastern Kentucky. A disease outbreak that, at least now since we have seen our first frost, should be on the decline. Plus, our fishing report is just ahead. Stay tuned. You're listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. Baglin back on Kentucky Field Radio. If you would like to hear this show again, or share the link on Facebook, or email the link to a friend to hear what the commissioner has to say, those links are easily found. You can go to Facebook. Our page is Kentucky Field Radio. Just put that in the search box. You'll also find us as a podcast on iTunes, and go to YouTube. You'll find us there under Kentucky Field Radio. I have never seen anything like this. I can't believe I waited so long. What will you say? My heart was pounding. This is Kentucky. It's deer season, and it's outstanding. 43 Boone and Crockett deer last year. Modern gun season opens November 11th, with archery season open now. Yeah. What do you say? I can't believe I made the shot. Get your license and deer permit now, and take aim on the thrill at fw.ky.gov. I may never score the winning touchdown and i may never win the 100 meter dash but i might but i can score one for the outdoors with a kentucky nature's finest license plate the bobcat butterfly and cardinal plate have helped protect nearly 100,000 wilderness acres across our great state and that's a win for us all yeah i may never hit a hole in one to win the championship no i may never kick that winning goal but the outdoors need a champion and they have one in nature's finest plates they have one in you we're back on Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. Back in our second half hour with Greg Johnson, the commissioner for the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, getting his thoughts on how fish and wildlife can partner with states and other agencies and local citizens to bring out the best in our outdoors. We left off with a new plan to bolster the rough grouse numbers. This is a game bird in eastern Kentucky. And we know that projects on the scale of landscapes aren't cheap. Seems like you're always on the lookout, Commissioner, for what can help us get more bang for the buck. Well, that's a good point. And the initial funding came on the elk trade to Wisconsin. Remember I told you that was cash on the barrel. Mm -hmm. And so that provided the initial funding for the program to get the plan in place, get our biologists hired. Now we're working with the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Wild Turkey Federation, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, a multitude of other partners that are coming to the table to invest in that initiative. And then some of these groups like Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, you say, well, they're, they're interested in elk. The reason they're interested in investing in the grouse program is, is elk need that young forest as much as grouse do. 
And so what's happening in the elk range right now? Well, now that mining has kind of almost stopped, those forests are maturing, and they're going through successional stages, and, you know, we're going to lose those early successional stages. We're going to lose the young forest areas, and elk need them as bad as grouse do. So it's, it's a win-win for all those groups to be interested in the same things. Commissioner, we're looking at deer season. I guess you have your sights set on a buck or a couple does. What do you think this year? Well, for deer season, yeah, I, I have a farm that I hunt on, and my deer season more now is taking time. My daughter's a school teacher, so when she's off, get her out to where she can be successful. I've got a niece that's going to come up this year that hasn't had any luck in Pulaski County. I mean, I think mainly because her dad and her don't really know how to hunt deer. But <laughs> I said, so I spend a little more time now with, with the younger hunters, mentoring them and helping get their deer. And when that late black powder season rolls around, that's when I get down to business. I love that late black powder season. There is a concern in eastern Kentucky this deer season. How widespread it is, I don't know, but it's worth addressing here. In Floyd County and in Pike County, there been quite the outbreak of blue tongue. I think the dollar and a half word for that is epizootic hemorrhagic disease. There have been double-digit numbers, over a 1,000 cases, at least as of October of this year, with numerous other counties in double-digit numbers. It seems you look at a map of where this outbreak has occurred, Pike and Floyd really have it, and a lot of those surrounding counties, dozens and dozens of cases. But as you go west and through the west of 75, Interstate 75, really tapers off a lot. Mm -hmm. Now, do deer hunters there, this deer gun season, this deer season, what do they need to be aware of? Well, you know, let's look at the disease to start with. Normally, an outbreak of blue tongue will occur in dry years. It's transmitted by a little fly or a gnat, the bite of that gnat on the deer. So usually in dry years, that gnat and the deer will concentrate around water areas. Uh, But that's not been the case this year. What I personally theorize, and I don't know if our vet was sitting here, if she would agree with me, but what I personally theorize is we know that insects are cyclical. We know that mayflies have better years of hatches than others. We know the historical onslaught of locusts, you know, over time. But insects, like a lot of wildlife, will cycle into high populations. And I just think in East Kentucky, uh, we hit a high cycle of this gnat population. And it's not just Kentucky. If you look at the statistics for East Tennessee, Western West Virginia, and Southeast Ohio, you will also see the disease hit in those areas. So it was kind of in the Appalachia area. Cold weather's here. That's going to slow it down because the insect's going to slow down. And so when the insect eater slows down or dies because of a frost, he can't bite any more deer and the disease, it won't be transmissible. Generally, any deer that have it, I think they die within about five to six days. It happens pretty fast. There shouldn't be... Any sick deer kind of staggered around the woods, but, uh, you know, if a hunter sees one, he needs to go ahead and report it, maybe pass on that deer and wait for one that looks a little bit healthier. But I think when, at least when gun season gets here, it won't be uh, too big an issue. Uh, even during archery and youth, we, we didn't hear too many concerns from hunters about um, seeing those deer and, and recognizing to leave them alone and report them, but try for a healthier deer, so... If you see a deer, and you might look for these symptoms. The acute form, it says, according to your website, animals may appear feverish, pronounced swelling of the head, neck, tongue, and eyelids, respiratory distress, internal hemorrhaging. And if you see a dead deer, it may be discovered near water. Mm -hmm. Any idea why they would be near water? As the disease uh, progresses in their system, it dehydrates them, so they get very thirsty. And uh, also the deer will be uh, confused. Uh, They're very approachable at that stage by humans. You know, they have no natural ability at that stage to be afraid of a human being as they normally would be. So any deer that lets you approach is probably going to be a a sick deer. They call this blue tongue. Yeah, that's from the bleeding, the internal bleeding that the disease causes. So blue tongue is a more uh, generic terminology for a a group of two or three other diseases. Most of the locals will kind of call it blue tongue. Most of the biologists will call it EHD, 
most of the serious biologists will try to pronounce that long line, that long name that you gave me a little earlier. Epizoic <laughs> I don't even attempt that one. <laughs> it was on your website under the Q&A, and it's a good thing to look at. Will this affect 2017 deer hunting? And the quick answer was no. It goes on to say the department encourages people to still go deer hunting statewide. And remember, most deer will not be affected, or at least after the first hard frost, the virus outbreak will stop. What it means is the the fly becomes less inactive or completely inactive, so it doesn't transmit the disease anymore. Now, relative to the number of deer that are lost, you know, if they go on our web page, they're going to see uh, probably literally thousands in Pike and Floyd County. Uh, we don't know right now how that really affected the overall population there. We'll probably know more as we get through the deer season. So we didn't change the zones. We want people to hunt deer. We want to leave the zones alone. We want to see what that harvest is so we can figure out if that harvest is less than, than other years, and that will help us determine the impact of the disease, and then we may deal with the zones going into next year then. The department's website went ahead to say, Harvest and consume only healthy-looking deer and enjoy the deer season as you normally would. That's right. That's a smart thing. Will this affect people at all? Not to my knowledge. It's not transmittable to people. Do you anticipate any effects on pets or livestock or maybe the elk population? No. um, Coyotes, vultures, they'll all eat, scavenge those deer, and um, elk are not susceptible to this particular disease. We've got a new year coming up. Commissioner Johnson, are you looking forward to anything new? What's up and coming? Well, probably the the newest initiative, and I like to use that term initiative within the department, and we've had several, we've talked about several, but probably the newest one that we're really excited about is our West Kentucky uh, Waterfowl and Wetland Initiative. The cornerstones of that are our Ballard, Bolt Wright, and Doug Travis wildlife management areas. And when you think in terms of perhaps you've lived in a house for 40 or 50 years, and it's time for a makeover on the mm-hmm. house. Don't give my wife any ideas. <laughs> but, you know, at Ballard, we, uh, we have geographically, we have gps over 80 structures on Ballard that are either need to be replaced, uh, are not needed anymore, or need to be fixed, or whatever the case may be. We've historically been moving water various places in these areas uh, for the benefit of not just waterfowl, but uh, wildlife. So the question is, to speak of it on a geographic scope, so if you're a duck flying over looking down, you really don't see a state line around Illinois down there. You don't see a state line around Missouri, and you don't see a line around Kentucky. What you see is a complex of wetlands and water. So can we work with Southern Illinois, Missouri, and Western Kentucky and create a modern-day geographic complex of wetlands for waterfowl and other wildlife? And what can we learn from each other about moving water and habitat? So the next step was to have what we called a wetland review that we hosted at Ballard. And over nine states sent people to participate in that review with us on Ballard. And that's where we took a hard look at Ballard and said, okay, if we were to manage this from scratch, how would we do it? Where would we build levees? Where would we move water? Where would we put pumps? And not only that, we created a sounding board. So the sounding board is made up of local farmers and neighbors surrounding Ballard. So the sounding board then is also offering us suggestions on, on that management scheme and some very good suggestions. But in that flat land, when you start moving water, there's not a boundary there, you know, at Ballard. It, it, the, it's going to move over on the neighbors, and some of the neighbors, in fact, have some water rights to the water that we have. So it's all got to be done together as a team. And so we're just in the very beginning stages. We have some exciting donors that are donating funds, and they're donating those funds to Ducks Unlimited. Ducks Unlimited then is is uh, working those through their grant programs. They're able to leverage those funds with more money. And then by the time they move it to us, then we can leverage those funds again with more federal money. So we can grow those funds to uh, put into that project down there. But in the end, 
It'll be a very large geographic area, not just the wildlife areas, but a large geographic area that we hope to have completely improved and make it probably one of the best uh, waterfowl meccas in the United States when we're all said and done. That's the vision. Still a few minutes to go with Commissioner Gregory Johnson of the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. What's down the road in 2018, we will ask in our final few. You're listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. Charlie Bagman back on Kentucky Afield Radio. We're back with our final few with Greg Johnson, the man in charge, the commissioner of the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. We learned something about wetlands from Hurricane Harvey when it inundated Houston, Texas. And I remember one of the news reporters saying, why is it that we have so much flooding here in Houston? And they said, well, the town used to be a wetland, Mm -hmm. and the ground would just absorb the water. Now it's all concrete. Yeah. And... It has nowhere to go. It just runs off and it floods. Another name for a wetland would be a swamp, mm-hmm. a marsh, typically not a very inviting area unless you're a turtle or a bald eagle, egret. Well, wetlands are are extremely valuable from several aspects. One is uh, groundwater recharge. So when that water is sitting in the wetland, it has has time to go down into the groundwater and recharge aquifers. Wetlands are natural water cleansers. So as, as water moves through a wetland, it becomes cleaner. There's chemical processes and biological processes in play there that, that account for that. So you have that going on. Of course, just the biological standpoint from insects, the waterfowl, the animals that all benefit from that. And then uh, wetlands that can hold water are natural flood preventers. So to give you an example, in 1999, I was involved in the great flood of the Mississippi River that put a lot of St. Louis underwater. And so what we hatched out of that was two things from USDA. One one was the Wetland Reserve Program, and the other was the Floodplain Easement Program. But both programs, the concept was if you could recreate natural wetlands up and down your main drainage areas, and we use the Illinois River as a pilot. So if you can recreate these wetland complexes on these river drainages voluntarily, you have to have landowners that voluntarily want to put their land in. Incentive-based means that the government or somebody is going to pay them to put it in because they're not going to be able to farm that land anymore. And then third, locally led. And locally led meaning you need a group of leaders or a board or a committee of some kind locally that helps organize and keep all this stuff going. And so once you complete these wetland complexes, you can hold enough of that water back and prevent a lot of flooding going forward. So those two programs were born in the 90s for that purpose. Can we basically stop the decline, or can we create new wetlands in well, this initiative? Yeah, we're, we're creating new wetlands in this initiative, yeah. yeah. And new wetlands have to be created on hydric soil. Hydric soil, what's that mean? A hydric soil is a naturally wet soil, usually heavy in clay. It's a kind of soil that's going to support wetland plants because of the moisture content. It's not going to be able to support agriculture because it's going to be too moist. Hydric soil develops in a regime that's inundated by water for a long, long time. So I had heard a definition of wetlands once that it's land that is covered by water for like two or three weeks mm-hmm. during the growing season. It's sort of soupy land. Yeah. Again, it's not where you want to go looking for your golf ball. Now, there's actually three characteristics that define a wetland is a hydric soil. And then uh, inundation, third, has a predominance of hydrophytic vegetation. So if you have those three things, then it would be classified as a wetland. That's good news for 2018. And it's surprising that I can remember all that, Charlie, because I've been away from that kind of stuff for about 20 years. You did well. (laughs) And you you came in here without notes. No, I I don't need any notes. (laughs) Here as we wrap up the show, 
we're talking a lot about the future. Kids are our future. How do you feel that the Department of Fish and Wildlife is reaching out to kids with this conservation type of message? And we'll do that through archery programs, through conservation camps, Hunter Ed, the Salado Wildlife Center. Are we doing a good job at reaching kids? Well, I think we are, and I think we've adjusted over the years. You know, we have some new programs now, uh, Field to Fork, to Hook and Cook. we got the Become an Outdoor Woman. We still have the three conservation camps, 5,000 kids a year go through those camps. And when I became commissioner, then we also started two of those camps to take in some of the older uh, young teens. That was a good move. Of course, our Slata Wildlife Area gets 50,000 visitors a year. The National Archery in the Schools program has been huge in Kentucky, started in Kentucky. If you ever go to the state meet, there's literally thousands of kids there, thousands of parents and friends. Have you seen Um, that that's making a difference for license sales or bow purchases here in the state? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you talk to Cabela's, uh, you know, archery equipment is one of the areas that's way up. And not only just archery sales, but uh, uh, sales to uh, females also uh, in what they buy to hunt in is is way, way up. I mean, if if you can remember going into a sporting goods store 20 years ago and look at the women's section for hunting and fishing compared to what it is now, uh, now it would probably dwarf the men's section because if... If they're like my wife, she'll buy a whole lot more stuff than I will. So <laughs> it's only because she needs it. Yeah, that's what she says. I'm on her side. Yeah. So so that market is out there, and we uh, we monitor those uh, markets and we monitor those sales in private industry, so we kind of know what the trends are. Anything else you'd want to discuss? No, not really. I just appreciate you uh, having me on and letting me say a few things, and uh, just encourage the sportsmen across the country and across the state to continue to be supportive of our department, know that we're doing the best job we can for them. And my door is always open. I think everybody knows that. Uh, call or come by any time. And if you got anything you want to say, I'm there to listen. Commissioner, I can tell that you are holding back your emotions. You know that I'm leaving at the end of the year. I know it's a sad occasion, but I know you want to wish me well. And what are you going to do, Charlie, when you leave? (laughs) What am I going to wish you luck doing? (laughs) I don't know, but I'll decide every day by noon. Oh, okay. (laughs) Well, I think that's a good plan. And I do wish you all luck in the world. Um, As you know, I retired the first time from the federal government, and I spent a good solid six months just doing nothing and uh, i advise it to everybody just uh, rest and relax let your mind recalibrate and then a whole world of opportunities opens up for you so yeah and i know you're going to be very successful in whatever your next endeavor will be thank you sir i appreciate you coming on sure thing we are out of time this is charlie bagler inviting you to join us in a week and we'll go inside outdoors again here on Kentucky Field Radio.